All right, let's talk about some neat array stuff. Uh, I'm just briefly covering some of the stuff in the apply the concept section, although you should be practicing that in order to get those really good, helpful skills. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is associating arrays with item collections. So if you have an array of information that is actually related to a uh, item collection full of things where, um, you know, everything in the array and everything in the item collection needs to actually be associated with each other. They need to be connected with each other. Um, this is what the idea of uh, what I'm talking about here. So now arrays and item collections are both incredibly similar. Um, each is a group of things treated as one unit. Each has an index or a subscript that is identifying them and you always start counting at zero. So you can actually have, let's say, a list box with a whole bunch of stuff that the user can choose, and then we can have that list box connected with a whole bunch of information in an array uh, where one of those items in the array gets shown to the user or used in a calculation when that user makes a selection or, you know, based on the selection that they do make. So we have some ways of associating the two together. So in order to get an array and an items collection that are associated with each other, uh, you would first, in let's say the load method, um, of add appropriate items to a collection using the .add method. Then you would store whatever related value of that item into the uh, corresponding position in an array. So item, the item at index zero would have its related value stored in subscript zero in the array and index one gets stored in subscript one and so on and so forth. And then you can use the uh, selected index um, property of whatever, say list box or you know, wh whatever collection that you're working with in order to get the correct array value in order to update things or use them in calculations or all that kind of stuff. For example, we have this uh, program right here that takes, you know, gives you a whole bunch of presidents in a list box, and then you can click on those presidents and it will um, actually show off the vice president in this label right here. Um, what happens is we have all of these uh, vice presidents listed in an array. Um, and we have all these presidents added in the form main underscore load uh, procedure as we usually do to preload list boxes. And of course the selected index is set to zero, which is really important here. But the uh, presidents are added in the same order that the vice presidents are listed in the array like this, which is really important because when we have the selected index of zero right here, which is pointing, you know, automatically selecting George Washington, well, we have uh, the selected index changed event procedure for list presidents, which will get invoked right here, which then updates the label for the vice president text to be the um, selected index or to be the vice president at the same index as the selected one for the president. So when we select zero right here, then in this event procedure, uh, we take this selected index value right here, which is zero, and then use that to get the value out of string VPs at that index. So at zero, which is John Adams up here, and we stick John Adams into the label vice president dot text. And then if I click uh, George W. Bush right here, this would be index three. So the selected index changes to three, which means that this event procedure uh, happens since the selected index has changed. Uh, we run this calculation, this whole thing becomes three. And then we get uh, the entry from string VPs at index three, which is um, oh, my brain went blank for a sec. Richard Cheney. Uh, and then the string Richard Cheney gets put into label vice president dot text. So that's how that's all working out. But they are associated because 
you know, George Washington is associated with John Adams, George Bush is associated with Dan Quayle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all of the associated values have the same indices in their respective groups. That is the really important part here is that you need to maintain the fact that they have the same index for something like this to work. All right, well, the next brief topic is the fact that you can have accumulator and counter arrays, which are arrays that group multiple accumulators or multiple counters into one array when all of those accumulators or counters are keeping track of separate values that are still related to a greater whole. All right, so here is an example application. It's one of those fundraising things where kids sell snacks to try to raise money for some fundraiser. Um, it's an application where you can put in how many of every item has been sold. So KitKat, I've sold five of those. I'll add that to total. Uh, the Bucket Bar Peanuts, I've sold three of those. I'll add that to the total and so on and so forth. Um, these labels keep on getting cleared, which is a little annoying, but whatever. Uh, take five bar, I will sell five of those as well and so on and so forth. But there are uh, counters or accumulators, I should say, accumulators down here that are keeping track of the numbers of um, every candy bar that I have sold. And how we can actually implement that is pretty clever. Um, now, the only time that we actually interact with this uh, array right here, our counter or our accumulator array is right here um, in button add underscore click. When I type in a value into the text box and then click the calculate button, uh, then int candy gets updated based on the correct uh, words, based on the correct candy. So we can actually make this a static variable. So we can keep track of the existing value in the accumulator for all of the counters contained within this array and candy right here. Um, and it also means you don't have to make it a class uh, variable, which is really nice. but and candy has uh, five different candies in it, and it's actually associated with everything in here as well. So we've added Chocobar, Chocobar Peanuts, Kit Kat, Peanut Butter Cups, and Take Five Bar, right? Select an index, search at zero, all that kind of stuff. But we associate our int candy with Chocobar. Or sorry, int, int candy at subscript zero with Chocobar, int candy at subscript one with Chocobar peanuts, and so on and so forth. Those are associated. And it's probably good to note that they are associated using a comment or something like that. But then um, the reason why we do that is then we can specify using selected index again, which candy bar has actually been sold and then update the amount sold correctly. But then we can also use this association to correctly display all of these in their appropriate labels, like so. So that is super helpful for this type of problem. All right, so now let's talk parallel one-dimensional arrays, because entries of two-dimensional arrays, they all have to be the same type. So all strings or all doubles or something like that. But what if we want to group multiple items of different types. Like what if we wanted a two dimensional array, but where one column was a string and then another column was a double or something like that. Um, like say we wanted to keep track of the number of inches of rainfall every single state in the United States received. Um, what if we wanted to have a 2D array where column zero is the name of the state and then column one is the name of the or is the amount of rain that they got in inches? Well, with 2D arrays in Visual Basic, that's simply not possible. So instead, we need parallel one-dimensional arrays, where one array is associated with each column, and then every row, like quote-unquote rows index, is going to be associated with the same item. Well, so what that would mean is we have two associated arrays in my example that I gave. One array would be all of the states in order, let's say in alphabetical order. And then the other array would have 
each of those states rainfalls in the same order. So California's index in the name array would be the same index as the amount of rain call a California got in the amount of rain array. So they're parallel. They're kind of sitting next to each other, lined up doing the same thing. Uh, they're both describing the same thing, but they're just not part of the same array on the technicality that 2D arrays uh, data types must all be the same. Here's another example. We have um, one array that has product IDs, which are strings, uh, and another array which has prices, and these are doubles right here. So C20P, the product C20P, um, if I wanted to get the price of C20P, I'd have to recognize that it is at subscript 3 in string IDs, so then its associated price would be at subscript, subscript 3 in double prices. But um, that's how this type of solution would work with these parallel arrays. They're separate arrays, uh, they're completely different types, but they have uh, that association which it, it doesn't quote-unquote physically exist within Visual Basic, but we're enforcing it with the way that we program this. All right, so here is that uh, particular product ID price application in action, actually. So what I can do is I can look up one of these product IDs up there. Let's say uh, M93K, um, get the price, 599, 012, 012. Perfect. Um, if I do C20P, that's index three, that would be 1350, which is great. And if I uh, do one that doesn't actually exist, uh, I get a message box just like that. So we have these associated arrays where we, by construction, decide that they are going to line up like this, where the index of each product is going to correlate with the index of each product's price. Um, and then we enforce it we enforce that association, that, that parallel nature through our actual code. So then what happens if we want to, let's say I'm looking up M93K and I want to get the price out of it. Uh, what, ha what we actually have to do is do a search to see where M93K actually is. And then once we know where M93K is, then we can actually find its price as well, given the fact that they are located at the same place. Doing the search is super easy. Um, all we have to do is we uh, take the search ID, which is the thing that I typed in. And then we, in this case, it's a while loop. Um, we kind of search through until the uh, subscript is equal to the length, or we find the um, actual string ID. So I typed in M93K at uh, index two. String ID uh, int sub is still less than string ID cell length, so we um, don't worry about the left half. We move to the right half. String IDs at two is equal to the search ID because M93K is equal to M93K. But the interesting thing right here is that all we do in this while loop is we increase the index. All we're doing is finding the right index where this matches. We don't do anything inside of the, else inside of the while loop. We're just using this while loop or this uh, until loop in this case, this do until loop to um, give us the right index. So by the time we exit this loop and go to line 27, we know that either our index is less than the length because we found our search ID or our index is equal to the length and then that just means the search ID wasn't there so we throw up the message box. But we use the loop to essentially search through until we find the ID using this while loop that or sorry, sorry, this do until loop that only adds one to int sub. 
Once we break out of the loop, we know that we have either found the correct thing or not. If we have indeed found that um, the correct index, if we have found the index where a string ID is at that index matches the user's search request, then, and we, we know that this is the case down here because that's the only time where we would exit the loop when the, the um, int sub is less than string ID's dot length, given the fact that we're using or else and have this check on the left side. It's a really clever uh, construction of this loop right here. Once we're down here though, and if we know that there is a match, and we know that there's, we can detect there's a match by checking if it's less than the length, then we set the price equal to the price at the same index and convert that to currency too, and so on and so forth. So that's a really cool way of doing it. We search, we traverse through the array searching for the right match. Once we find the, the index where the match is contained in the names array, then we just get the price from the prices array at the same index due to the fact that these are parallel and we have enforced that the whole time. Isn't that neat? I think it's really cool. So that's a really helpful thing that we can do for this type of application where we're trying to match product IDs with numerical values. All right, so this is another um, example of the same problem, but what we've actually done here is changed the prices into strings so that we could fit everything into a two-dimensional array. Now, there might be reasons why this could be good. There might be reasons why this could be bad. It depends on your application. In this instance, if the prices are staying kind of steady like this, or if they are consistently set, and they're not really changed mathematically in any way, this is probably fine. Um, if they need to be modified, and especially if you need to put them on discount or something like that, then and you need to modify the values in the array like that using mathematics, then it's probably, it, it, you might have to worry about like changing it to a double and then doing whatever math and then changing it back to a string or whatever, or you might just choose to do parallel arrays. But in, in this case, because we are representing the prices as strings, um, this happens to work. Also, it's important to note, by the way, that uh, when you're using a string like this, you have to type it out like 13.50. With a double, you could do 13.5 and leave it at that. And then the C2 uh, formatting would work just fine. But this case, is working with strings so we actually have to format it ourselves like that we can't just put in the one decimal place and expect it to look good regardless um we have this two-dimensional uh th this two-dimensional array right here and i want to do exactly the same problem where i can type in the ID, so M93K, and get the price for it. Just given to me like that. Um, and if I type in AAA, it gives me this ID not found. But essentially, I want to search through a two dimensional array in order to find the product and then get the associated price with it. Well, it's going to be a little bit different than before. Because remember, before we were. Um, searching through just the names array itself and then using that same index to get into the price array but this time we need to search every row and then check if that row's name column makes sense so it's slightly different what we're doing here is we're finding the correct row uh we started at zero and then we uh essentially search until the row number is greater than the largest actual row number or else um string items at in at the current row and at column zero which is the names column right here is equal to the search id so you know, the first condition is pretty much the same as before. If we get to an invalid row number, in this case, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 
a uh, intro value of five, then we know we haven't found anything. So it would be greater than get upper bounds at zero. Uh, and then we come down here and that is where our else case is. Um, and of course, if we, oh, I should say, I forgot to say for the last uh, version as well, but the reason why this or else is so important and it's so important for this intro greater than stir items uh, get upper bound, right? To be to be on the left side. Um, all of that is so important because if this is false, then we know int row is a valid row number, so we're safe to check in here. However, if this was on the left side and this int row was on the right side of the or else, then we'd be trying to uh, index into string items before we check to make sure that int row is a valid uh, row number. And if it was an invalid row number, then we get an error. So you want to check to make sure that it's valid first, and then use or else for your short circuit, um, your, your short circuit evaluation, and then do all the stuff where you're actually indexing into your array. Regardless, with all of that, um, the actual check to get the name is a little bit different. You just have to go into the current row number and then go to column zero, which is the name column. Uh, but otherwise, everything is the same. You just increment int row while you don't see the correct row number. And then as soon as you pop out of the loop, you know that either the row number was bad or you found your product. So you check here. Hey, did I find the product? Or sorry, was the row not bad? Because if the row was not bad, then you did find, you must have found the product based on how the, uh, the do until loop works. So if the row was not bad, then you can actually get the, uh, get the product's price by going into this correct row that you have, but then going into the price column, which is column one in this case. So that's a uh, small difference here. When you're searching through a two-dimensional row, typically your search term is going to be in column zero, or at least, you know, even if you have multiple terms that you have to check in order for your search to work, like maybe you're checking three terms in order to make sure that you're working with the correct value for like the rest of the data in the row, right? But like whatever search terms you're looking at, you're probably going to want to put them near the beginning. Um, but when you're doing the search, you will uh, search through every single row and then check the value in the correct column against the search term. So in this case, the value in the name column against the search term. If we were searching for prices instead, if I wanted to find out which item would, uh, costs $8.99, then you would be checking in the current row that you're looking at, but the price column instead. So this zero would be a one. But that's how that works. Um, that is how that works. Now, something that can be really helpful, especially if you have an application that makes heavy use of this uh, class array like this, this class level array, and if this array is particularly complicated with a lot of different columns, this is actually a great place where named constants might be helpful. So I'm going to actually declare uh, named constants for columns. So what I'll do here is I'll do private const, um, let's say int, because it, it only needs to be an integer. I'm just doing this for column numbers. Int, uh, let's say column name. So call name equals zero. This says that the um, column column name is zero. Oh, my bad, I almost forgot the as clause. As integer. And then I can do something similar for price, the price column like this, and set that equal to column one. And then instead of doing zero, I can do int uh, call name. 
and then one would be int call price. Like that. And it doesn't, you know, make a huge difference in this really small example. Say I had like 10 columns of information, which is easy to have. And all of those columns have like very different purposes, very, they're very different descriptions of everything. And you really want to make sure that you're working with the right column. You can actually use constants like these in order to really make sure that you're not confusing your uh, column numbers. I've run into that problem before. Um, using constants like this actually probably saved my life when I was working on my master's thesis because I, I had something like um, 15, 20 columns of data that I was all looking at trying to process in this massive, massive, massive program with all kinds of files and functions and everything doing everything and whatever. And using constants like that made it so much easier not just to remember or not just to type in like what column I'm trying to use instead of having to constantly look back at uh, column numbers on my data, but it also made it a lot easier to come back to different things that I had previously written like months ago for my code and remember what data was being worked on. So I cannot stress enough how helpful it is to do something like this. It's a really good habit to get into. Um, and of course, I wouldn't use row name and column name for these arguments right here because, um, or sorry, I, I wouldn't use uh, column name, column price for these arguments right here. I guess it would just be column name right here, but uh, I wouldn't use that because these zeros mean something completely different. I'm only using them specifically for the zeros that I put as um, column indices for my two-dimensional arrays. But that is my free advice for you. I highly recommend you take it. But it, it could save you just a lot of time. All right, well, that is the neat array stuff. And with that, that is our discussion on arrays. Um, I hope that this is a topic that you find very valuable.